Hello, hello, and welcome everyone to the 25th Text Freshism Virtual Salon. This salon is a bit of a special one because this actually marks just about one year since this whole thing has started. Because um, kind of do the math, 25 times two, um, I mean, no, 20, 26, 25? Anywhere. Anyway, it's it's about one year <laughs> since since this all started, and we've have definitely come a very long way in that time. Um, a lot of new faces over the uh, over this past year. So many more artists. Um, it's it's been a wonderful journey up so far, and I hope that you know the next year, the years following, continue to be as great as this past one. Um, so in today. We are actually going to be doing things a little bit differently than the past um, several weeks of, or several months rather, of meetings that we have been. This is going to be a more kind of open forum, um, very short presentations, um, virtual salon today, which is more or less in the style of our original salons, like those first couple before we actually had like a concrete structure with the whole meeting. And that's only happening because we didn't actually have somebody people set up for presentations this time around, but kind of comes full circle, right? You go back to how things were in the beginning. Um, that being said, uh, we do have a couple of people that volunteered um, prior to the start of this meeting that wanted to um, share some projects or so, some updates about what they're working on. Um, that includes, I believe, Darcy, Deanne, um, I think there's two other people. Um, one I don't see in the chat quite yet, uh, but that's that's all good. It's this is going to be very loose, very very free, just discussion, sharing, all that good stuff. So that sound good to everyone here? Yeah, yeah, nodding. Yeah. Uh, Verneda, I think, right? Verneda, did you want to present? Yeah. Yes. All right. Yeah, Verneda. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, do we have any volunteers that would like to go first or you just, or I can pick someone, either one. Darcy, you wanna go first? Yeah, I'm just hoping this thing comes up. All right. Um, oh, and if you're not um, sharing, could you please mute your mics just uh, yes. to keep everything copacetic? It's just loading me. Thank you. All right. So we'll see how long that takes. Let me see if I can share my screen with this. Actually, it's not letting me do anything else, Gene. It's just hogging the whole. I'm not sure this is even going to work. Well, it wouldn't be in the spirit of our salons if there wasn't at least one technical difficulty that happens. So. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> seeing a screen share item here at the moment. And I don't. Oh. Gene, can you help me? Um, what are you using? What, what, um, I'm trying to bring up alt space on my Mac in another window and to go into my virtual world so I can show you the world. And I've, oh, wait, here we go. Now it's coming up. Okay. Now, oh, I got my cursor back. Let's see if I can share screen, share screen. Fingers crossed. Open system preferences. It's probably asking for permissions. So, um... I need some help. I have some technical support here. Um, so it's you're trying to share your screen from your Mac, correct? Okay, so you have share screen. Now, uh, alt space, it says unknown. Oh, this is us. Yeah, alt space VR, click it. Hold shift, select window, hold the shift. No, no, don't do that. Just click share. Open, Open system preferences. Okay, one second. I'm gonna take over. Okay. That is a thing that happens. My yes. husband, Gene. Hey guys. Um, Hello. You know, now on Zoom app. 
it's also I think, the <laughs> I think Guillermo has a question or wanted to say something. Um, sure, Guillermo. Okay, saying so that correctly. We have to temporarily get out of Zap. Oh, uh, so is that okay? What are you doing? I'm going to temporarily get out of Zoom. And go back into Zoom? And go back into Zoom. Okay, I guess I won't be first. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's that's fine. It's a Mac problem, or oh, Mac security issue that we just got. I'm, um, I'm ready to, I'm queued Bye. up to Java if you need someone to go next. Okay. Um, Guillermo, I see that you have your hand raised. Did you have yes. something you want to say first, or? Oh, you can't speak? Are you muted? Muted, he's muted. <laughs> uh, You're muted, Guillermo. Oh. oh. Hold on. Am I missing something in the chat? Huh. Well. Okay. That's a little unfortunate. Yeah. Wow. That's all right. Um, if if there's issues communicating, um, please feel free to use the chat. Um, and I will definitely see it because I am watching it like a hawk, as I always do. Um, but anyway, um, uh, Renata, you can go ahead and okay. share what you have to share. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I wanted to share with you um, my latest exhibit. I have my first solo exhibit, just happens to be a um, fully text expressionist exhibit, which is at the Buford Digital Corridor Base Camp Gallery. The Buford Digital Corridor is a uh, technology hub in the South Carolina Low Country, and they're also developing one in Charleston, South Carolina. So the Deep South is getting on board with the technology revolution. Took a minute, but we finally got there. And they were all excited when I told them about tech expressionism as a global art movement. That is, I believe, the next iteration in creative expression for um, creative artists. So um, my background is in medicine, but I retired from medicine in order to come home and be with my nonagenarian parents who um, were failing in health and also my younger brother who had a stroke. So I was a caregiver for a period of about 11 years. And for those of you who've had that pathway, you know that it, you know, it's a hard walk, you know, so to speak. It's very, very stressful, um, economically disadvantageous in a lot of ways resembles much of this quarantine that we've been under the last year or so. And uh, to handle the stress, I um, used photography to document what was, what was happening with uh, my parents and with myself um, as we went from point A to point B in the uh, caregiving journey. And after they passed away, I started assembling um, these um, artwork, these photographs into photo montages in order to tell a multidimensional story as to what was happening with us um, and hopefully leaving a record that younger generations in the family can relate to. And I urge everyone who is involved with um, caregiving to utilize art therapy because in, you know, as far as I know, art is a medicine just as much as medicine is an art. So here we have some of the artworks that are in the Gullah Me exhibit. And uh, I'm gonna focus on, cause there are many, but I'm gonna focus on a subset of the artworks. These are self portraits that I, I call this subsection synonyms. And what makes the synonyms remarkable and why I call it that is because in, this, in the process of doing self portraits, I came up with several images that look more like family members than like me. And um, this one is, is entitled Face. And uh, Face is a nickname for my brother, Grady. Uh, Grady's two years older than I am. We were playmates growing up and we're still 
close to this day. And uh, when I did finish this, I sent it to Grady, but I didn't have the opportunity to explain in the email um, that it was actually my face. He looked at it and he thought it was him. And he was thanking me for doing an interesting portrait of him. So somehow um, the artistic impulse had pulled into um, this androgynous uh, genetic base where my face had morphed into my brother's face. And uh, so here we have um, another self-portrait that looks an awful lot like my grandmother, Deary. Um, and Deary um, has the hemifacial mask, which is a, a theme in synonyms, but she also has a Mardi Gras type mask superimposed upon it. And, um, and as you can see, the eyes have different colors and whatnot. And uh, Deary was, um, you know, very fair complexioned um, woman. She was Charleston Creole. But she had a secret, and her secret was that actually her mother was white. And, but her mother was a white woman who was living as a black woman. Um, my great-grandmother had posed as a, a mulatto, because you know, we have many people in the black community who are so white, they pass, they quote unquote pass for being white. And we, I had many members of my family like that. Um, they vanished across the color line and you never really heard from them again. But for some reason, my great grandmother, <clears throat> Mamie Suarez, um, came into the black community, married my great grandfather, who was William Suarez. And uh, she passed as a fair skinned black woman who could pass if she wanted to, but chose not to. But in reality, she was white. And we found this out by DNA testing. So looking at my grandmother's portrait, my grandmother's synonym, I thought to myself, well, that double mask is on her face for a reason, uh, because she had a secret that we all didn't know about until, say, the last two years. So that's uh, Gullamy Deary. And um, this synonym, looks is my face, but it looks an awful lot like my um, aunt Mina. Uh, Mina was my mother's sister. Uh, she was very fair. My mother's very brown skinned. Mina got away with a lot of mischief as a kid and got my mom in trouble. But they were best buds until the, the day that my aunt passed away. But Mina's portrait is very different. I tried to put a golden hue to her hemifacial mask, but for some reason, the pigment you know, just wouldn't take. And instead there's this very stark contrasting imagery here, which is you know, very much like her, very um, terse, um, uptight, you know, everything is black and white, um, that type of thing. And also here, This is another self-portrait and it looks just like my Uncle Bertie lights. Um, Uncle Bertie passed away in 2017. He was dying actually, as I was doing this portrait, I didn't know that he was passing away, uh, but I visited him in the hospital shortly before he died. And, um, and I had this in an exhibit um, and when they, piece came back to me because it didn't sell at the exhibit. I gave it to my aunt as a gift and she looked at it and she thanked me. She thought it was Uncle Bertie. She, she actually thought it was him. You know, I just thought there was a resemblance, but she didn't see anything about me in it. She just saw her husband. They've been married for 50 years. So I thought that was, you know, fascinating. But what all this is telling me is that when you're working in a purely digital environment, the advantage of a digital environment is that it allows you to use, to sculpt light on an electronic canvas. So you, we change the shadows in subtle ways as they fall upon a face. And I think those shifting shadows that we manipulate in a digital environment 
um, enhances aspects of a family's visage um, th that's been set up by DNA in such a way that from um, shift to shift, it highlights or downplays various aspects of that family DNA facial map that um, you otherwise just wouldn't see in other family members. So DNA in many ways um, lays down a template for our faces, what we call family resemblances. And a digital environment allows us, I think, uniquely to um, manipulate that. And I, I think that's an, an advantage of text expressionism. So. Oh, buddy. Oh, thank you for that. That's mm -hmm. very interesting. Uh, it, it's also, <laughs> your, your project made me, uh, reminded me of just, there, there's this thing that happens with me where um, apparently no matter where I go, no matter what part of the country I go to, there is someone that always says that I resemble very closely someone that they know. Like mm -hmm. I've had this happen in Tennessee, Alabama, Kentucky, Ohio, here in Virginia multiple times, Georgia, like all over. And when I went to Hawaii, people were asking me if I was native Hawaiian, which mm. <laughs> as far as I know, I, I did not look at DNA. Like Check your DNA. You may well yeah. have um, you know, uh Hawaiian blood in your family. <laughs> Maybe, maybe. I didn't, I, I did do a DNA test and there was a lot of Nigerian and Ghana apparently, but I didn't see anything from Hawaii, but just mm -hmm. the fact that, um, I don't know, faces are so interesting because it's like there are like specific templates for faces mm -hmm. and there's only so many ways that genes and stuff can be recombined to produce wholly unique visages. That's so right. there's going to be like overlap and I guess in my case, like I've I've even met some of my doppelgangers. It's it's crazy sometimes yeah. how closely we end up resembling each other and it, we're not actually even related. Yeah, that you know of. That, well, that I know of. Like as far as I know, we don't <laughs> not connected that way. But it's very mm -hmm. interesting. But thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Also, Lee, I see you finally made it in after very uh, about twenty minutes worth of struggle. <laughs> welcome. Um, Lee was one of the um, artists who presented last time, but he was having issues getting in today, but I'm glad that uh, he's in here now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I actually, not only did I have issues, but well, issues getting in here today and also after the last time that we saw each other, uh, as a few of you know, I, I had um, quite a few issues. I ended up getting hospitalized and um, didn't get intubated, but... Um, I went from breathing about 5% of my lungs to back in full force. So, you know, happy to be here. Happy wow. to see everybody. I'm glad to see you recovered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm much happy. And those were beautiful pieces, Vernita. Those Thank were, that you. Was a beautiful piece of your, of your uncle. Gorgeous, you. gorgeous piece. I'm going to go back on mute, though, because I want to let everybody talk. Um, but I hope to talk to you all a little bit later. Yeah. All right. Take care. All right, did anyone else have any um, comments or questions, concerns, or just praise to give out? Because we, we do that here. No, no stranger to that. It's very beautiful work. Very interesting. Yeah, wonderful work, Vernada. Beautiful. I said something in the chat, but we wanted to speak out as well. Fantastic Absolutely. work. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing, and thanks for, you know, also sharing the idea or the word expressionism in your materials, you know, that's definitely much appreciated to help try to create awareness. Oh, yeah. It's an interesting approach and purpose, which is, uh, I think that's really interesting about it as well. Thank you. The, uh, oh, we, we do have one, one question um, from Tintin. So is all your work sourced from family photos? No, <laughs> matter of fact, only one part of the Gullah Me collection, the title, title of the exhibit is Gullah Me, I'm Gullah. That means I'm descended from Blacks who were brought as slaves 
to the South Carolina Low Country, and you know that's my the history of my ancestry. But only one um, piece in that is from a family photo, which is the portrait of my father, uh, Vernon Lights, that I did. Uh, rest I restored it and I recreated it, and then I also included it in a photo montage. But everything else is um, either my face and an interpretation of my own face, because that's the only thing I really had to work with while in a caregiving situation. I wanted to paint, right? But I had no space and no time in which to set up an easel and brushes and you, you can't have turpentine around sick people and things like mm. that, you know? So I needed a sterile environment. I needed an environment that could travel in my pocketbook. So I had to fall back and use my digital cameras and um, my, my smartphones because they fit in my purse. And I could work if I was in the back of an ambulance, if I was at bedside and I see you garbed up with gloves and all this other stuff, I could still work, you know? Um, so I had to use the instruments at hand and the technology made that possible. So my objective was to paint with my camera. All right, so there, a lot of photographers tell me I have a painterly approach to take pictures and I think that's true. So I use colors and I, and I sometimes import into Photoshop and other uh, software and just use the brushes to do certain effects like in Wither Tomorrow, there are a lot of different, uh, the portrait that looks like my uh, uncle, it's a lot of color involved with that. And I had to do those, you know, enhancements um, with software in Photoshop and whatnot. Oh. And you know, I, it's, it's interesting how, um, I don't know, take we uh, creators, artists fall back on what they have access to or find ways to mm -hmm. like continue to create just based off of what they have around them sometimes. And I thought, think that's actually late. I know for me personally, I, I end up getting into digital art all those years ago because that's one of the things I had regular access to. I didn't always have access to you know, pencil and paper sometimes or even crayons to play with like, but my computer was always there. Right. So end up creating on my computer because that's what I had. Yes, I, I started off creating textiles and I, I didn't deal with faces at all. I, I used paint, you know, to create mosaics and whatnot and uh, fabric designs and blankets and whatnot. And then I evolved uh, into um, more complex structures. And uh, but I knew that I felt uncomfortable with just doing the tech piece because I know this world and I know this world likes to have an either or dichotomy. And I said, if I come at them, this is around 2001 to 2003. If I come at the world and say, oh, look, I got this art I made on the computer, they're gonna freak out because they, you know people are very elitist. And I went to these elite schools like University of Pennsylvania, Bryn Mawr College and all that. And I said, they're gonna find a way to stick it to me. So I better learn how to draw for real, for real, <laughs> and learn how to paint and sculpt for real. So I went back to school and I learned how to do all that stuff. And, and I say, I'll have a way to fall back and protect myself should they try to discredit me. <laughs> you know, I knew that was coming. I wrote essays about it and all that stuff. But when push came to shove and I really needed to express myself, all that paintbrush and pencil and easel and turpentine, all that, the whole world just vanished. You know, and the only thing that was accessible that could get the job done was smartphones, iPad, Photoshop, laptop, boom, lab. Oh. Uh, in the chat, there was a request to, um, is there an online version of the exhibit that there's a link to? It, it, the link I put in Linktree um, has it, the um, full Facebook um, artist talk. All right, and I will go ahead and relink that in case anybody missed it. So there it is. Yep, yep. All so right. Three, you know, so there were people from all over the world. There were people from the University of Ghent who showed up for the artist walk and um, they had never heard of, a te of text expressionism. They contacted me on Instagram 
um, beforehand and said they're going to show up. They're doing like a research project about artists and their relationships to museums and galleries. And, and they came across the text expressionist thing and they didn't know what it was. <laughs> so I, yeah, I introduced them and I gave them a link to the tech expressionism site and they showed up at the art book, which I thought was really cool. Nice. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you very much, Renata. You're welcome. Really appreciate it. All right, and I think next up we have Deanne. I think you had a presentation to give or a short. Oh, Darcy, are you ready? I think I'm ready. Oh, okay. Well, that works too. Right. All right, there we go. Yep. Okay, so you can all see this world? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Okay, well, this is live. And that avatar is a human being who's visiting my world who I don't know. So we can go back in this world and we can go forward in this world. I want to take you into one of these. Okay, so all around, what you're seeing all around here for a good reason. are light sculptures that I paint in all, in uh, with tilt brush and uh, goggles on. Can you help me fly in here, honey? Look up. Okay. Yeah. So when you're in this world, I, so obviously you can do this from a Mac. Let, let me just take over the. Uh, oops, sorry. Just jump in a bit. Yeah. Okay. Does this work? Okay. Yeah. yeah I'm gonna look up yeah. with the F key. Okay. Now you can go straight into it. Okay. okay. All right. So go into this. Now I've been working with a. Uh, Can you all hear this? Yeah, the, the audio is coming through. It's a little it's a little distorted because just yeah. the limitations of Zoom audio. So it's basically this has spatial sound in it. So depending on where you are, if you have different things, then you can blend them and you can fly around in here. If you wear headphones, you get an immersive experience. Uh, it's not just stereo, it's the sound is all around you. Can you go down to? Uh, F. F goes up. It's no. Go down. I'm sorry. The... And Hit. this piece here. Hit me again. I'm sorry, it's very slow to move yeah. around this way, but. When you when you have headset and controllers, okay. it's very easy. Okay. This piece is actually an a, also an AR piece uh, and there's a QR code for it. So that if, if you get, take that QR code on your phone, So a bunch of those new pieces and then the other new pieces that I've been doing are these. You can point the cursor at a point and click. That's good. And these will be, I'm going to do all of these as NFTs. And I've just signed up with an organization that's going to be doing that sort of thing.
The ones in the background, so all of this work, all of these paintings are from snapshots taken in those 3D virtual, in those 3D light sculptures that we were, one of which we were just in, okay? So you'll, so if I can explain this, let's see. Um, with this one maybe. Well, this one is even better. So for this one, for instance, this painting, what's the other thing about this digital work? It's, it has no size. You can have it whatever size you want, yeah. right? You look up at it. But you'll notice this one has these brush strokes. Those come from taking the AR object, putting it outside, take, and that's my garden, my actual garden, flower garden from a couple years ago. So you can take this AR object outside and take a snapshot, which will give me a, whatever part of that AR object I see and the environment it's really in. And that's how I create some of these, I call them the inside outside pictures of these murals. Now, a lot of the work that I've done, like this one also exists on canvas. So I do print them out on a large size uh, on canvas. These are billboard size. These are, the, these are billboard size ones. Here's another one of the new ones. kind of a different way of looking at art and making art. This is one of my first um, This is one of the first light sculptures that I made. This was before Oculus Quest existed. And it was done with a vibe. Into your other studio? Yeah. Yeah, just go up to the go to the center. I want to teleport to uh, an earlier kind of more traditional thing. I don't know if I can get in there. Oh, I can. Hang on, I'm going to teleport to another art gallery of my work. It's a little more traditional. And all the artworks in this art gallery also exist on canvas at the same scale as you'll see them in this art gallery. So this was kind of a first step for people more accustomed to traditional art gallery environment. Well, as we're waiting for that to load, um, I think there are a couple of questions that are ready for you already. Okay. Um, I think we can answer the first one already. I, this is a VR gallery. This is, in, this is not the kind of VR gallery that the art, that the um, traditional art galleries and museums generally are talking about. Right. This is actually a 3D virtual world that, that um, it's not a, a 3D projection of a two-dimensional thing on your laptop. It's just not the same. <laughs> 
it's a newer generation, although it's been around forever. These virtual worlds have been around a really, really long time. It's not the same technology as like the uh, uh, virtual art fair, the Hamptons virtual art fair that's going to start on Thursday. Or so this is a different technology. It's, this is actually uh, in a, something called Alt Space VR, and it's actually part of the um, BRC VR 2021, which is Burning Man Online. And this is one of the worlds. So what I created is a virtual world. And in that virtual world, you could have whatever you like, create whatever you like. And I've created these art environments. Is there another question? Um, actually, that tied into another question, which was what software did you use to create these, which um, was it all space VR with another program or all space oh, VR by itself? They're created with Unity. Oh, they're all created with Unity? You, it's a game engine. Actually, it's a yeah. game engine. Right. Yeah. And actually, we took the um, Unity models from Tilkbrush. Okay. With difficulty. A lot of difficulty. Lighting issues, blah, blah, blah. A lot of problems. Plus, uh, because this is all running on Oculus Quest goggles, which has about the capability of your cell phone, but not maybe as much. You need to, you're stuck in a low poly situation. Right. All right, so this, this looks like an art gallery, kind of, I think, right? Looks more like an art exhibition. All of these artworks exist at these sizes on Canvas, as well as in this virtual world. And there are two different kinds of paintings here. There's a bunch that I call the Syracuse pictures. And then there are these pictures, which are, I call the inside and outside pictures series. And I call it that because as you'll notice, these have, these are snaps, these, well, you may not notice, but I was, remember I was describing how I take my AR object outside? Well, I also take it inside. So this one, for instance, on the right here, navigating this way is very difficult, obviously. This one is in my studio. Uh, Oh no, this is, yeah, this is my studio in my loft. And I took my, one of those light sculptures from that that you saw that I showed you inside of, I put it in my loft and took a snapshot and took it into Photoshop and created a painting. And that's true of all the pictures on this wall. And they're about 36 by 60 inches, something like that. 30 by 60 inches. Now the ones on this wall are created by taking snapshots in tilt brush of pieces of my light sculptures and turning them into paintings in Photoshop. This is an early one. This is an early one. You can see the brush strokes and the background. Now in, in Tilt Brush, you have an option for what your backgrounds look like. The backgrounds I was in were all black, so it was like I was in a big black void. But it turns out they're not totally black, so all of the pictures on that wall. Okay, so you see this picture all the way on the left? The green one, the big green one. You were in that light sculpture in the garden, just was a different color palette. Maybe you'll recognize it, I don't know. Okay, remember we were in this one? And we were going in between those streamers that came down that were red in it when we were in it. Does it look familiar at all? Okay, so this is a snapshot of that in, in, in Tilt Brush. 
that I turned into this painting, okay? But the model itself was a different color until I played with it in Photoshop, okay? These are all inside and outside pictures. The one on the left is outside and the two on the right are inside. And they're all with the same light sculpture. Now we're gonna go not quite as traditional. Okay, this is my yard at my house. And uh, it's, we, this is, we created a dome to put this in. This is my house over here, okay? And this is the gallery. It has no wall. You can see right through the walls from the outside in, okay? And you can go right through this wall. And this is one of the light sculptures, okay? It's a different scale. This actually was the one you were in. It doesn't have any sound, but you can go in it. So as you look through it, you could imagine if you took a snapshot of this, you'd have not only the color brush strokes, but the background that you're seeing through it, right? That's how I basically create the paintings. And this is an interesting view of this environment because you can see the dome the house, my barn, the gallery, and that's actually in a different kind of environment entirely in this world, right? Jean, is this particular uh, portal gonna take me back to- Yeah, the well, uh, yeah, I updated it. All right, this do you is... wanna go back to the other world or has everybody had enough and just wants questions? Uh, let's see. Um, I do not. Oh, there, there was a question from a little earlier. Um, Renata wants to know is how do you mix or make your colors? In tilt brush. And Just using tilt brush? Yeah, okay. In Photoshop. Now, this year I invited one of my girlfriends to give me one of her artworks. And I put it in my in the world that I, we were in before. I'd love to show you her piece in my world. She's a world-known uh, ceramist and um, world famous. And uh, she's at Syracuse University. Her name is Margie Hudo. And I thought it would be fun to have other artists in my art world. So I asked her for one of her sculptures, her ceramic sculptures, which was very small. And we... Um, Jean digitized it and we put it in the world and made it the size that I'd like to see her make it in the real world. And then I put a horse under it just to give it some scale. So that's a sort of fun thing to see. And I'd say in the future, I might be interested in having other worlds attached to mine or something with other artworks of people, you know, that would make sense to do this with. I'm not opposed to that Can't at all. Be fun to have some other sculpture in here, actually. Or photography. Or photography, or you know, something that you know. I've shown my work in in exhibitions, my work on canvas, and exhibitions with Margie Hudo, her ceramic pieces, and also uh, Beth Bischoff, her her very large, gorgeous photographs, black and white photography. So um, I think it's a good thing to kind of show the world that to expressionist work isn't so alien that you can't include it in a lot of other art exhibitions with other kinds of work. I find that very often when I submit my work to exhibitions, the curator is trying to make a whole cohesive kind of looking show and mine is too weird. You know, it just doesn't look like enough like, or they think it doesn't, or they aren't sure how to do that. But I think it would be in all our interest to encourage that kind of, you know, that kind of thing. We don't only have to show with digital, other digital work, you know.
So I invite anybody who's got Oculus Quest goggles to come visit me in this world where you can actually be an avatar and freely fly around in the space. We also put some horses in there that you can ride around on and fly around on. Why not have some fun? It doesn't have to be like a traditional art gallery, right? Yeah, it's the... Still it's there. still getting us yeah, there. Yeah, this is a huge, it's uh, slow. because of yeah. all the audio. I've, 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 um, several curators have come into my world. And the last one that we were just in, the consensus was looking at art that way is almost exactly like looking at art in a gallery and it makes them feel very comfortable and they can go around and see the work that way as an avatar and talk about it and react to it in, in a normal way. In the first world I showed you, there's a fundamentally new way of experiencing the art. It can be all around you. You can drift and flow in it. You can see around it. It doesn't have actual physical mass. You can go through it. It's a very different way of experiencing art. Uh, Renata wants to know um, what specific model of Oculus are, uh, that you're using. Yes. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oculus Quest, either the first one or the second one. The very earliest one they discontinued that didn't have the full functionality. Right. But the current one, the two and the one are great. And they're not even that expensive, but, you know. Uh, this um, one that we're going into um, now, does I it usually have a like long load time associated with it or? Not this, this long. This is, I mean, I unusual. this is unusually long. It's partly because I'm running on my Mac instead of, I don't really know the answer to this. It is longer than usual, much longer. Normally it takes almost no time to get in and out of these worlds. I don't know why this is such a problem. Because of Zoom. It, Sorry, yeah, it's yeah. because of Zoom. Zoom is probably interrupting things. Um, you could maybe potentially try reloading it. Yeah. You can. Ah, we're here. Or, or I could just speak it into existence. That, that's also a thing. Let me show you Margie's piece. It's over here. I think it's bad. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Who's that? Oh, somebody. Oh, in the, in oh there the are world. people in my world. You can hear them. So this is a ceramic sculpture. F to go up. Oh, yeah, Jean. Okay. Well, that will definitely be an interesting addition to uh, our recording for anybody that ends up watching. <laughs> this is so awkward. Way to yeah, get around okay. It's different than the headset is much more fluid. The headset, you're, it's like a completely fluid thing. This is like a nightmare to move around and it's not what I normally do, so I'm not even good at it. There you go. This is what I mean about putting a horse in here for scale. V. Mm -hmm. You can go all the way in here. And you can sit on here and you can look out of it and see things out of it. The things that one amuses oneself with, right? So in case you didn't notice, this is from Margie Hudo's series called um, the Excavation Series. And uh, I, I kind of talked her into this so that she would get more involved in technology. And uh, we basically went to a huge recycling warehouse that recycles computer parts. And we fished in there five foot high by five foot wide and long gigantic boxes and pulled out computer parts 
and Margie cast them in ceramics. And this particular piece here is a cast keyboard. In case you didn't recognize the keys on it. And then she made it in ceramics. So she made a mold out of the, out of the keyboard and then she cast it in ceramics and glazed it. And that's how she made this piece. You know, once it's in ceramics, you can do any, you know, in clay, you can fold it and bend it and all that. So it's a sort of piece of technology. You see the keys here? Oh, this is so torturous to move around in. I'm so sorry. You want to go down, hit V a couple more times. And she put some mice in them too. You notice there was a mouse on top of this? This is actually a mouse that she made a mold of and made into ceramics. The original model was 50 million polygons. Yeah, Gene said the original model that he had was 50 million polygons. And we reduced it and down. And he had to reduce it down to, to like about 20,000. 20,000 polygons. So the other fun thing about digital art is in this world is that it doesn't obey the laws of uh, physics or anything, right? So for instance, these paintings, you can look at the front and the back. So this is the reverse of the painting and you can go right through it. And you can see it from the reverse side. And it's fun because it works in both directions as a, as a painting, right? So if there are questions, that's good. Otherwise I'm done or we can go float around in another art, artwork if you want. What do you want to do? You want to stop? Um, considering it is now 3 p.m. We have a little bit around an hour left. Um, I think it, that would be a good stopping point. But thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation, Darcy. It was a nice seeing your world again. I think I saw a very early version of it a couple of months ago. Yeah. And then that was, um, that thank you. Um, you. Know, no. Awesome work, Darcy. Amazing. <laughs> Who are there? No, it's at the top, the red thing at the top. Ah, got it. Good. And then it goes back to. Okay, to wait. Way. All right. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think you did have like one last question. Uh, Tommy wants to know about the sculpture conversion process. That's more than I can answer right now. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so you're going to have to wait for that one, Tommy. <laughs> and I don't do that. Jean does that. And Jean has serious technical chops. Let's put it that way. Got it. All right. But it is an issue. It's not straightforward and easy. Got it. All right. So got a little around an hour left um, for anyone else that wants to go. I know Deanne, um, we had Deanne. Colin wanted to do something. Lee wanted to do something. And I actually also had something I wanted to share at some point. So we'll, we'll see how that all <laughs> works out. Um, but yeah, uh, Deanne, did you want to go next? And then I had emailed them. Um, sure, I can do that. All right. You've got it.
Okay, so this is going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm a part of, and actually there's a few people in this group, I believe Rick and I think Rebecca Tomba is also a member of the International Society of Experimental Artists. Um, every year they hold an annual symposium where they do workshops, artist workshops and that sort of thing. Um, the one that's coming up next year is called Pushing Boundaries Reboot. Um, the reason I'm talking about it is because it's going to be in my neck of the woods, um, next door to Edmonton. So in St. Albert, Alberta, Canada from September 5th, 1st to 5th. Uh, it's going to be in partnership with the Art Gallery of St. Albert. So I don't know if you, anyone's familiar with IC, but it is a group that was started um, because they really weren't seeing a space for more exper experimental types of art, different methods. And, and experimental is kind of defined by the artists themselves um, in regular art groups. And so this group was formed in 1991 and they now have about over 500 members in US and around the world. A lot of the membership is based in the United States. Um, they host two virtual juried member shows per year, and then their international open show coincides with the annual symposium. Um, so we are calling this Pushing Boundaries Reboot because Pushing Boundaries was supposed to happen in 2020, and like everything, it did not. <laughs> it, went, it went online, it was virtual. Um, and so now the organizing committee, um, of which I am a member, is looking for expressions of interest from artists for possible demonstrations or discussions. Um, it can be anything from a half hour keynote speech to an hour and a half presentation to a um, We're looking to provide a variety of experiences to artists um, who have a varying levels of ability. Um, but we also wanna try and make sure we sort of target anywhere from the beginner to the more experienced artist. And one addition this year or coming up for next year is the opportunity to propose online or partially online presentations. So you can consider something that's pre-recorded, a live simulcast, a live recorded or online only, which I think fits in well with a lot of people's life's lives in the last uh, 18 months. Um, digital art content is welcome. And this is just stuff I thought was thinking off the top of my head from different presentations that I've watched in the salon. So apps and programs, simple or not so simple, programming for art, music or video incorporation, digital collage, mixing art with more traditional art um, or virtual reality like we just watched. So if you have an idea for a workshop or a presentation, um, you can submit an expression of interest the deadline is November the 5th. Um, a short list will be created from all those that are submitted. And then um, once that happens, the people will be contacted to discuss scheduling and logistics and confirmation of pricing. Um, presenters can be engaged for more than, for more than once for the same or different sessions. And a final decision will be um, made by December the 10th of this year. So just to give you an idea of uh, past submissions. Um, so this is Paul Gravett. His photograph, it was the best in show last year. Um, he does experimental photography. Um, I've submitted a couple of times to, their, to the, some of their shows so that some of my work. Um, and then this is Pamela McKinney. Uh, this is a digital painting and collage on, printed on acrylic. So really a large variety in terms of the types of digital work. I find the group in general is very open to pretty much anything. Um, they really like to see um, people pushing the boundaries in terms of art. So if you were even so inclined to want to attend, um, in addition to the daily art workshops, there'll be social activities for some evenings and a group tourism activity will be planned um, during the symposium as well. Um, either before or after, you could consider traveling further afield to explore Alberta. So Jasper National Park is about a four hour drive from St. Albert. Google Maps today said three hours and 42 minutes. I think it depends on traffic. Um, travel in the parkway, and then you can connect to Lake Louise and Banff National Park. Um, we also have a lot of dinosaurs in Southern Alberta. So um, Drumheller is about a three hour drive away. It has quite a cool, um, 
Dinosaur Museum and the Hoodoos are quite interesting. They're very different in terms of their geography. But we'd be happy to help anybody if they wanted to choose, chose to come to think of places to visit in St. Albert or Edmonton or beyond that. So if you have any questions, um, there I'll put links to the expression of interest and additional information in the chat, as well as contact information for anyone who has any other questions, unless you have something for me right now. I know Rick is also in on this um, salon today, so he might be able to also answer some questions. And that's it. Yeah, well, thank well, you for question. that. Um, yeah, um, I saw in your materials that, uh, you know, uh, is I see, I, is it pronounced I see, or yeah. I think I might have heard Isaiah too, but it's probably I see, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I've heard it pronounced both ways, but I saw there was something um, about how, you know, they're looking for proposals of um, sort of like collaborative uh, efforts between both their organization and individuals and then other organizations. So I was thinking, you know, there might be an opportunity for whatever we're sort of doing here collectively to, um, you know, do some sort of a group. Uh, I, I don't know what exactly, but just seeing that in the materials made me sort of think, you know, would there be sort of an opportunity for that? And if so, like, how could that be structured or, um, you know, uh, and certainly I would put it out there if anyone's interested in spearheading anything like that. I'm, I'm at the saturation point personally, but um, I, I think it could be a good opportunity, you know, to, cause, and, and, you know, and the same thing with Darcy, I was, I was thinking, you know, the ability to curate uh, an exhibition within a new type of space that's interactive. Um, we certainly have, you know, a hotbed of talent here who are creating the content digitally. It could be an interesting exhibition to exist in, in an environment like that, you know, so. But let me say, that uh, out there. every time you bring in something, it's a huge amount of work. It's a whole new story. It's not like um, I have, and Jean have the capacity to put a whole art exhibit of a whole bunch of artists in something that would be like so much of our time. It would be like, I mean, I can manage a little. I want to do a little, but I can't devote my life to that, you know. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I think there's definitely, I think IC is definitely open to, you know, different ways of showing art as well. So I know like we have the Kunst Makes Tricks galleries and that sort of thing. And so whether that could be something that kind of happened in conjunction, I don't know if Rick is still on, is in the salon or not, but maybe he can. Uh, do you have any money for funding anything or, I mean, getting stuff, produced and shipped and installed in Alberta and Edmonton is expensive. There are size, um, and if you're shipping physical work, they do, I believe they do have size um, recommendations, but yes, you are, you are basically, you know, you're, it's, it, it's the same thing for, you know, me shipping to anywhere in the United States to do a, um, some kind of show, just, the, you know, going in the opposite direction. So, I know that they have talked about that. Um, I don't know how they, they haven't had to deal with it yet. This is the first time they've actually done an international location like outside of the United States. Um, so while there are some artists from Canada who have participated, the majority of the artists are from the United States. So they were just looking at shipping within the United States itself. So there is that as well. But um, if you've participated in other exhibitions, then I would think you'd be somewhat familiar with sort of the process in terms of getting your work to and from, and you wouldn't be shipping some giant sculpture. <laughs> you'd be shipping something that was a little more reasonable in terms of getting it there safely and back safely. So the funding as far as getting the works to and from is, is the responsibility of the artist. Um, and that's usually the way it goes, so. I don't see that changing. Although some people, what they do is they participate, they bring their artwork with them and then they take it home with them. So it, it really just, unless actually that might not be true. It might have to be hung beforehand. I'd have to ask Rick about it. I haven't actually been to a physical one. The last year, what is going to be my first time participating and it didn't happen. So it was quite easy to just send my email of yeah. my artwork. <laughs> It's generally, generally the easiest thing. You don't have to pay for uh, shipping costs of sending an email. 
Yeah. <laughs> now if that became, if that started to become a thing, that that'd be that'd be terrifying. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, your your email was over this size. You have to pay a premium. Yeah, exactly. In, in 2012, it, um, I, w- I did show some work in Isaiah, and we did have to, we had to bring it with us. Um, on, on the plane, we just came two days earlier and installed it. But it really wasn't that difficult. When you say the artist has to pay, what else is new? <laughs> well, actually, it's not 100% the case, but it's a lot, it's the case. Yeah. For a lot of organizations, but it's not always the case. And mm-hmm. in the end, one has to ask: Is it the role of the artist to provide free entertainment, free art entertainment? Really, is that the role? Well, of you? Yeah. Is that burden always on us? No opportunity to like recoup our uh, time and our money, anything. You can apply for private funding. You can do that in advance. You know they do. Uh, okay, I'm just saying. I think these organizations are kind of lazy and they don't take responsibility to do the fundraising, which in the past they might have done. Maybe, maybe. But again, There's every organization is different. Apply for. There's a lot of funding that these organizations could apply for, but they're getting a free ride, basically. You know what? I, 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 I just had a comment to make on this. When you said earlier it was different, uh, my experience is that every museum I've had working, I've had to pay for. Or if they get a grant, or no, I don't mean a grant, excuse me. If they get a donation for that's specified for my project, I never see a dime of it. It goes to the museum, you know, for something that they're covering, like building a platform or whatever. So it, it's it's always been like that. I, I well, mean- I don't always have that situation. I do have some cases in which the all of the shipping is paid for both ways, and sometimes other expenses are also covered. And I'm just saying, well, that's great. Sometimes I, the case, you know, and it would be better norm, if we're the case great. more of the time. <laughs> None of us have so much money to be, you know, funding, paying for everything all the time. We make the stuff. It seems to me that these organizations that are benefiting by having the audiences because of our work should do the work to raise some money and pay for some stuff. I, don't, I think that's a reasonable request. The money that I see raises generally goes towards prizes for the, in the art shows themselves. And I, I have, haven't done a lot of art shows or juried shows where there were actual cash prizes, but I find them to be fairly generous in terms of um, if you actually do if, if I might interject for at least a little bit, I, I think we are kind of deviating from the main idea here about um, what, what our opinions may or may not be about um, funding for certain projects, which they are valid concerns, but I think that's for a different time and discussion right now. Yes, ma'am. So uh, it's 21. Could anyone that isn't uh, actively sharing, please mute yourselves. Um, thank you. Uh, Lee, did you have something that you need to add or? Uh, yes, well, there, there is an organization called CODA, C-O-D-A. I think they're based in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, it stands for Coalition of Designers and Artists or Coalition of Designers and Architects. They specialize in working with artists who can provide um, artwork that will be installed in spaces within commercial buildings or public places. Um, And they're one of the best that I've ever dealt with in terms of making sure that artists get all of their cost covered when working on a project. You might want to check them out online. I'm actually presenting at their conference in November. Ah, there you go. All right, well, there it is. And, um, oh, I don't, Deanne actually stepped away. Um, but I know there were, you said you were going to provide a link to um, the organization at some point, so. Yeah, sorry, I had to, my, one of my kids was at the door and the other kid wasn't hearing her knocking, so I had to go let her in. Um, uh, yeah, I will, once I, we're done discussing if there's any more questions. I'll put the links in the chat. And then if anyone has 
it held they have the expression of interest and other information and you can kind of go through that if you're interested all right well thank you very much for that uh and with that um i'm not sure does anyone else have any questions or comments uh lee other lee yeah the, we got the deadline for the submission or the uh, for the interest but what's the actual date of the event oh it's uh uh at the beginning it was september 1st to 5th 2022 all right well, there you go <laughs> all right and now uh i think colin i think you had yeah, Colin, what did, did you want to share your Yeah, I just wanted to to let you guys know now that the now that we're actually in the recording. I mentioned this before the recording started, but um so next session um which I think is September 14th. 14th? Um yeah, so we're going to yeah. um be having an opening for an artist an artist reception an opening for the next round of the collab uh exhibition and uh that entire session is going to be devoted to that so we're not going to have separate presenters but certainly all of the artists um you know involved in that show are invited to come and talk about the work and you know um th this was like sort of something that davo came up with really early on in, in this project uh, in terms of um, artists working with each other passing a digital file back and forth to come up with you know unique collaborative works and uh, the pairings for this round are going to be uh, Malavika and uh, Ryan Henderson. And then we have uh, Nagin and, and Brandon Gellis, or Gellis, Gellis, I think. Gellis? Um, I Gellis. Gellis, yep. And then uh, Darcy, who, who just presented, and Michael Pointer are going to um, be one of the pairings. And C. Moses and Michael uh, Price, are, that's another pairing. And then Michael Pointer... Um, is also paired with Caro Ramonde. So there's um, six pairs all together. And each uh, pairing produced, you know, a number of uh, digital works by passing the file back and forth. And those are going to be installed within a Kunstmatrix gallery. And that's going to be, you know, up and accessible both on our homepage and uh, within, you know, the Kunstmatrix platform. So um, today is actually the last day that the NFT Now show is up on the homepage. It's going to be archived along with the collab number one show. And then there's a couple things, you know, in the pipeline. Um, Patrick and I are co-curating uh, this uh, Texpressionism 2021 exhibition, which is coming up in the fall. And that was sort of like what, you know, kind of kicked this entire thing off in terms of, you know, that was Helen Harrison's suggestion, initial suggestion in terms of growing this out was to put a show together. And um, it's been in the works for a little while. So that's gonna be an exciting show. Uh, probably around a hundred artists, you know, from maybe at least 30 different countries are gonna be represented in that exhibition. Um, and and uh, I believe Patrick is gonna be trying to time that with the, the wrong biennial. And, um, you know, it would be placed as a uh, pavilion, I believe that's the plan anyway, within the, the wrong. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to let you guys know what's, what's going on. And then the, um, Southampton Arts Center show is still in the works for the spring. Um, that space is actually having sort of a major art fair that's opening up this coming weekend, um, which, uh, you know, is definitely going to bring some visibility to that venue, um, for sure. And, um, you know, it's all uh, pretty exciting. And if you guys haven't checked out the, uh, the Instagram feed recently, you should look at the current um, featured artist, the most recent um, artist that I posted. Her name is Suzanne Anker, and she's out in that area in East Hampton. But she also, I believe, runs the undergraduate program at SVA. I'm not sure exactly yeah. her position, but she's pretty um, involved in that program. And her, both her and her husband, Frank Gillette, are going to be in, in – um, uh, both of the shows, upcoming shows, and they're both amazing artists. Um, Frank actually was one of the seminal video artists. Um, his work goes back to the days of ARPANET, and he was actually involved with ARPANET as from an artistic standpoint. Very interesting artist, and um, I had an opportunity to, to train him in Photoshop uh, probably 20 some odd years ago, which was a pretty cool uh, experience. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to pass that that information on, but definitely, you know, come to the next collab 
it's going to be it's going to be really cool i think and uh we're going to do another sort of online opening in the spirit of the nft now show that we did last time so that's all from me hi my name is also a sun ip how are you sorry co co office space it, it's a, it's a thing sorry um, <laughs> And, and Davo, definitely, if you have anything to add about the collab, since it was your baby, you know, feel free to, to share about it. Yeah, uh, I actually have two things. Um, I, I've been doing a lot in the, I guess, the proverbial shadows, unless you've been following my social media accounts and um, seeing what I've been up to with that. But um, one of the things that I was working on or have been working on is a artist book slash book of short poems slash autobiographical uh, project. Um, it's going to be released as a series at the start anyway of four, um, four books, each with about 50 poems each. Um, I can actually show you a little bit of what that looks like, but I've actually already got um, a paperback version of it with the initial intention being um, an ebook that you can get on Kindle or other, other products, but um, definitely walk you through that right after I'm done talking about the collab stuff. So for the collab stuff, I have to apologize to everyone that's kind of been involved with that up to this point, because it has been a very long and drawn out point up to the second one, um, actually seeing the light of day or seeing any news about it. Um, and that's because I was working on a lot more projects than I thought I could handle probably, but it's all good. Um, it is done. The next one, um, which would be cl uh, collab number three, is going to be starting up fairly soon. Like there's going to be a lot less on my plate that I voluntarily put there um, as I've gotten a grapple with how much I can actually handle on a consistent basis. <laughs> and um, I've actually kind of streamlined some of the things that were pain points from last time with, you know, actually signing up, getting paired off and having that all happen in a lot uh, having that happen in a much more concise and organized fashion, whereas it was kind of sporadic before. So I actually did the time, set up forms, and have documents already set up for that. Um, that being said, um, back to my ebook thing or my ebook project. Uh, let me see if I can actually share. Let me see, where is that? Thing. Yeah, you know, I'll just share my entire screen and go from there. All right. So the software that I was using is actually a software that was created by Amazon called Kindle Create. And it's got this nifty little feature, I think, um, that allows you to kind of organize or guide a reader. Um, it was originally designed for people that did like graphic novels and comic books and things like that. But I was like, I could totally use this for artwork purposes. So um, if you do decide to um, view this as an ebook through Kindle or something like that, you're going to get a very different experience um, versus you know, buying the paperback version because you'll be able to see, hold on, I will get to that point. So usually every page starts with a reading of the poem. And then following that, it zooms into different parts of the image before immediately backing out to show the entire page. And the entire book is set up in that same way. And I thought that that was, when, when I discovered that I could do that, I thought that was exceptionally uh, neat. <laughs> And just from a like artistic perspective, um, I think having like a guided visual experience with the work and the poems is it adds definitely another layer of appreciation and even room for critique with that. But I thought it was fascinating. But these books, um, they're all divided up into essentially there's four fifty chunks. So there's 200 short poems in total. Each book covers about 50 poems or so. And every book covers somewhere around the order of maybe five to six years of my life. 
the first one, generational, covers the first um, six years of my life or five or six years after my life, starting from age six or well, three to six, eight around that area, but pre middle school, early elementary school around that around that region. And the next one was from like middle school to like early high school. And then the third um, was like high school. And the last one was just like all of college, the fourth one. And they're all about, I, I have to say like the, the general subject matter is very, very dark because a good chunk of my early life pre from age just six to Almost now, it, there's been very, 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 very uh, dark moments <laughs> all throughout. Um, issues with my identity, issues with my race, issues, a lot of issues with my family, um, just all sorts of things. And this book, it was actually described um, when I showed a couple of the poems to a friend of mine, he was like, this seems like trauma processing. And a lot of it is actually like that, like this is a project that I am literally bearing some of the deepest parts of my soul and my psyche. And every poem does have some bit of art um, linked to it. Um, the connections are much more blatant with some. A um, lot more abstract with others, like this one. It's one of those more abstract ones, but uh, don't want to give too much away. Like this is the first 15 or so pages of um, what I've got worked on, but it's been a very interesting project. Um, and I would say I've, I realized as I was working on it, as I was writing these poems that I had not necessarily process some things as well as I thought because I found myself getting emotional as I was writing these or like rereading some of them and recalling the stories associated with some of the poems that they're tied to and I broke down crying a couple times uh, because I was remembering those times I was like wow that's still actually really raw for me right now and this is years after I had thought that you know I had properly processed and gone to therapy counseling over and it's like no it's those feelings are still very much there, it's still very sensitive. Just wanted to make sure. So it is, uh, yeah, it is, it's an experience, <laughs> but that's, that's all pretty much I have to share about that. Uh, if we have any questions about that, well. Post the link. Oh, post the link, yes, sorry. Terrible at plugging myself, right? <laughs> Give me one second. Got my paperback one on the way already. It's like... <laughs> Yeah, this, the first one of 50 is out. So it's uh, the first 50 poems are currently done, published. Um, the actual ebook is going to be available on my birthday on Thursday, September 2nd. So if you're waiting for the ebook launch, that's, that's the release date, September 2nd. The paperback is already available for purchase, which several people have already decided they want to pick up. So yeah. Six, six, four, five. Great project, Davo. Thank you. Very, very deep. Yeah, you pulled that together real fast. I think you <laughs> called me up like two weeks ago, and you're like, "I'm thinking about this idea of putting together an ebook." And like, two hundred poems later, <laughs> it's it's already on Amazon. It's like, dude, um, that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah. yeah. See, I I have this thing where I can hyper focus sometimes, and then other times it's like, maybe. Maybe you have some focus today, maybe not. But this one, I think, because it was just so close to the heart, um, I was able to just get it all out in one go. Because I wrote those poems. Um, it took me four days to write 200 short poems. And apparently, that's not normal. Because I was talking to other people, and I was like, you did what? And how long? <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's, it wasn't hard. They're like, poetry. You wrote 200 short poems in four days. It's like, yeah, is that, is that, is that not something that commonly happens? Apparently not. Uh, <laughs> the, the writing didn't take so long. The art 
I had to take breaks because I was not sure on how certain things were going to actually look together. So that took a little bit more planning, but the actual writing, that was the easy part for me. Paste the link in the chat, Davo. I d oh, I think I actually messaged somebody privately. My bad. There we go. So Davo, the um, the ebook yes. with animations, that's just the native part of using the, the ebook software? Or um, is there anything special you need to have to, to get that? So if I think I'm pretty sure that is functionality that only works if you're using um, a Kindle and okay. like using the Kindle app. And if you're using like a Kindle paper white, I don't think you'll get that sort of functionality because the paper whites are like really scaled down bare bones um, version of the app. So it's just going to be page flipping as normal. But like okay. if you use the app on your phone or like on an actual like tablet, then you would probably i think you're pretty sure it's supposed to work that way too i see like the regular desktop version and the non-kindle paper whites um versions of the and and the software that you use the kindle what did you call it kindle create yeah it's called kindle create and and anybody can get that yeah oh that's cool yep it's funny when you brought it up you know my first instinct was like well why don't you publish it as an nft you know and and and, and it's really interesting to think about how philosophically as a model of digital distribution, you know, this is the antithesis of the NFT. And, and, you know, um, I think it's really interesting to consider, you know, the idea of, well, you could make something available as a singular digital object for right. however many ETH or something that's available as an essentially open edition digital object and make it, you know, infinitely more affordable and accessible to a mainstream audience you know so um yeah it's just it's something to think about yeah I, I i did play around with the idea of um actually publishing each poem individually as an nft and having each poem as an individual piece of art with the um but i don't know that might be too much <laughs> there you go you could do yeah. both i mean <laughs> yeah but you can still you. do do some of that later. You can yeah. still, after this launch, later, you know, uh, revisit it as an NFT rollout. Right. You know, in that format. So it's, yeah. That's really interesting conceptually, because then it's like, you know, somebody owns the original poem, right? Paired yeah. with the artwork. And yeah. then, the, then the then the ebook becomes a, a piece of documentation, you know? Yep. So it's, uh, it's it's been very interesting to work on and just get out. Um, but uh, I think, I think it's been waiting to happen for a minute because I, I had already had thoughts for a long time about writing something along the lines of an autobiography, but I didn't think a traditional autobiography was going to be able to do my life justice. So I had been kind of toiling with the idea for a long time. I was like, well, I want to start writing poetry again. And I'm doing art a lot more consistently than I used to. So why not mesh everything into one thing? And that's, that's how this came about. And I, I felt like I needed to act on this or get this started sooner than later. Otherwise, me knowing me, it would get put, put off to God knows how long. <laughs> so if I didn't get this out now and as quickly as I did, it just probably would never happen to begin with. Hey, Dava, what do you think about, um, I don't know if there was anyone else lined up, but I know that there's a couple people who are here for the first time. And, you know, if anyone wants to just say hello, introduce yourselves and let everyone else know a little bit about your practice. You know, we used to do that in the past before right. we sort of filled the whole time up. So, you know, <laughs> um, certainly anyone that, that like to is, is welcome to. I don't want to step into the moderator shoes, but, um, oh. you know, figure to put that, that out there. Yeah, I, I kind of got get in the mode of caring more about everyone else. But yeah, I, I am an artist too, by the way, if, if anyone <laughs> was uh, uh, not aware of that fact. But yeah, I, I am an artist too. And um, my work ranges on like digital drawings and digital paintings with, of course, now poetry is added into the mix as well. 
Um, but yeah, that's me. Um, you can see more of my work on probably my Instagram, Dalva Bradley Art, or go to my website at www.dalvabradleyart.net. Um, that's D-A-V-O, by the way. And um, we have, oh, Tintin, yes, I'm sorry. Tintin want to um, share, share their work. So are you, are you there, Tintin? No, yes, maybe. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Yes, yes, can hear Great. you. Great, here, let me go here and we'll go there. All right. Um, my name I'll leave is Tintin 23X only because it's, uh, I, I kept using that as a, my art world away from my professional world. Um, and I just seem to run with it and it works, you know. That being said, um, let me just double check that you can hear the audio on a piece. Do you have, do you hear the audio coming up at all? Um, um, scratchy records. Not getting a thing. Okay, well, then I'll leave the video for each individual to decide if they want to see or not. But um, my background uh, after coming out of art school as an experimental video artist, filmmaker, studying those people like uh, Ed Emshwa, Michael Fraga, and Sean Gorwitz. I decided I need to make money, so I endangered myself to the uh, wonderful world of advertising and became a highly paid technician. But that didn't really leave me a lot of uh, time to make work. And the original reason I did it was to get access to very expensive machinery to make work. <laughs> so being the broke, uh, endangered entry level uh, post-production slave that I was, um, I suddenly found myself going off to Kinko's with uh, my little fetish uh, items of sound photos and portrait postcards from the turn of the century and spending a dollar a shot making collages on color Xerox. This is early, early 90s. And uh, at the time, I was, oh, I was really happy with the images that had come up and I started to realize that a lot of the pieces, which you can see in one or two of these, let's see if I can get a, a good one that shows a close up on a piece. The back of the portrait postcards would always include um, advertising for the photo studio. And what I would do is always keep that as kind of a base layer to the collage. And the collages were all built upside down foreground to background because it was a color Xerox. This is, you know, the same way you would do it on a scanner nowadays. Um, and I would print them out one at a time and then deconstruct the collage and move on to another piece. And I was really kind of happy with the way that was turning out. And suddenly I would have about 50 or six of these and I'd paint them up on my wall. And I thought, oh, they started to look like storyboards and design elements to uh, piece and as uh, time progressed and I got access to more machinery, I was able to utilize these same techniques in creating a video work, which is showcased here. I'll actually include the link to my site in the chat for people. Um, but I would just go to you, Ben. Here. Now the piece itself or the the series of images, which I currently, you know, leave and sell off as uh, stills, or actually some have been turned into NFTs at this point, um, became a basis for a video piece, which, you know, that in itself developed a narrative based on the structure and placement of pictures, which I always found really kind of amusing because I don't know any of these people which is uh, why when the first artist was sharing and it was her image and family images and stuff, I, I thought, wow, that's incredible because I'm using sound photos of a similar nature of people I have no idea who they are and creating kind of a uh, false narrative or uh, allowing the viewer to apply and bring their own narrative to the structure. Uh, the writing on the piece and my writings at the time were all based on uh, at the time of reading a lot of Sartre and Camus and 
the, the pieces themselves, you know, I was like always writing either free form or poetry based on that because it was the early 90s, it was dark, you know, art grad, art school grad, so it was totally appropriate. Um, and from there, they developed into a video piece, which is this, this one located here. There's a whole slew of video on my site, but I just want to speak to Lost and Found, which is this piece in that series. From the video itself, uh, at the place I was employed, we started making really nice 8x10 C prints. Uh, from video. So I decided, oh, let me round trip this and take the stills which were generated on a color Xerox the machinery built to make duplicates, which are completely unduplicatable because the collage itself was deconstructed immediately after printing, which became the basis for a design for a video piece, then round tripping fully into stills or C print photo prints back out as individual art pieces. And in some of them, you can actually see the imagery itself going from the collage piece built on Xerox as an upside down piece to still printed from the video itself, which you know kind of created this whole series of uh, work. And the series itself being called Lost and Found were is the titles based on the fact that all these images and family histories and narratives were lost by people who either lost the photos or through an estate sale the family didn't keep the pictures and the sound part being either my acquisition either finding or buying them or finding debris on the streets as i walked off the kinkos or thus the dead leaves and such as well as the sound narrative that the audience would bring to the video piece. So that's, as a work in a series, I always found that kind of uh, interesting. And to that point, just a, a quick gleam over some of the other series I do. Um, working through text again, you know, pulling lyrics from songs either at random or that I happen to be listening to or that I'm working with. And then through a random number generator, pulling images uh, from my own library and compositing those all up into a whole series of pieces which are being done as uh, 12 by 12 uh, metal prints of just the size of like an album cover and and sold off or gifted off. Um, there is uh, a few other pieces and series that I'm working through. Signage per se is all based on the text of signs, street signs, road signs, and uh, again, random selected imagery to work those back through. Um, my NFT thing, and I have to laugh every time I hear someone talk about making NFTs, and, and Colin actually, you and I have met and we discussed the NFT thing. The, uh, I actually found a very carbon neutral site and I'm moving all my NFTs off to that. Um, but in the link is a link to my site and that includes uh, a little bit more about my content process and my history. Um, does anybody have any questions on the Lost and Found series, the collage work or round tripping to video and back to print work or conceptually what was going on there? Can you guys actually hear me? <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we can oh, okay. hear you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so now I know I, who who Batman's real identity is, but I won't, I won't reveal it. Um, but if, if you I want like me to, him, um, <laughs> it's the month of Banksy. Why not keep it going? Man? If, if you want to be added to the artist index, just shoot me an email or something with whatever sort of information you want me to include. And um, cause oh, I was like cool. looking through yeah. there and I'm like, is he in there? And I'm like, I don't, I don't think so, but I definitely <laughs> would want to add you. So that way it could be referenced when this, this salon is published. Um, so, Need name as you want to be listed, um, country, city, Instagram link if you have one, website link if you have one, and yeah. that's it. Cool. Excellent. Any questions or thoughts? And, uh, and will I will I have the mic guys? I just wanted to say that Rubina, I'm messing up her name horribly, I'm sure, but there's some beautiful work. There's some nice work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, oh no um, question. <laughs> Cheryl, Cheryl wants to see a few of your works up close. Oh, um, in, well, when you say up close, what particularly do you <laughs> I, the, I the imagine... website this is we are actually looking at the website yeah and if she goes there depending on the resolution of the screen right uh, or if, if you have particular requests like <clears throat> certainty this is not part of the lost and found series actually a friend bought a church and she's converting it into a performance space so i as a house learning gift i built that some of these up on the net are quite large but if you do have uh, particular pieces you want to see uh, bigger, uh, please let me know. The, the, the color Xerox and the digital photo pieces, like these, those are native at uh, HD size. And then some of these other ones go all the way up to like 20 feet by 30 feet. So, oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's nice to have access to professional level machines and storage you know right <laughs> which yeah which honestly as i've been in advertising 30 years actually i think i've done work for less uh mr mossgrave that is right but <laughs> it's uh i never trust people that come into the business that want to do it to make money it's only if they're like really interested in knowing how stuff gets done you know or or you know looking behind the curtain so to speak i'm making the magic you know, but to that point, you always end up with a certain amount of time in your life that you don't have access to stuff and you really get jammed up. So you have to make work with what you have available, whether it's right. pencil, paper, color, Xerox, is, uh, yeah, nowadays cell phones. In the early 90s, the closest thing you had to a cell phone was uh, the Polaroids or the one shot cameras you drop at uh, the drugstore. You try and get uh, film developed nowadays. I dare you. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Stanton. I don't think there's oh. too many questions. No, there there was a compliment. Um, oh. Michael says that he loves your compositional style. Thank you. And can um, can't wait to see your videos once I actually see them. Oh, the just a, a preface. The, these are going kind of chronological, and I'm trying to dig up the stuff that fits in between the more recent and the really old ones because you know the technology is like trying to find what works for what but these go from 89 through like music videos for my friends and other experimental videos for you know the sake of doing them some of them have been out like this one actually this piece was uh, featured on mtv as a bumper for a long time um usually on sunday nights <laughs> but yeah there, there's a mixture of some commercial and artwork uh, and i always find that kind of interesting uh, being able to mix commercial venues or really get like mass mass audiences uh, i love gallery shows and setting things up like that in fact uh the lost and found series itself when i moved from one company to another we were one of the first uh we moved into the space on 22nd Street and we bought the whole floor, but we only set up the first half because we didn't have the money for it. So I asked the EP and the owner at the time, I said, oh, do you mind if I do a pop-up show in the back half of the space? So I lined the wall with about 100 of the color Xeroxes and I had about three monitors looping the Lost and Found video. And you know, we had like 50, 100 people show up. It was awesome. But the, sometimes the audience is a couple thousand at a time or, you know, it's a, it's a little mind numb, but you know, getting a, a feature or TV audience to see stuff is that's that's kind of really kind of you know, intoxicating. <laughs> right. But thank you. And I was I was actually thinking, oh, you know, I should share something soon. And when I saw uh, Ravina's, I hope I'm getting your name right here. Uh, Ravina's work, and you were like, yeah, if anybody wants to share, I was like, you know what, do it today. So I'm playing hooky from work for a half hour, hour. <laughs> Whatever works. Thanks again. No, thank you. Thank you. And in the interest of time, because we have like, we literally have like nine minutes left, but thank you for your presentation. Um, I know it's, we have two people that would at least like to say something. Oh, Victor, do you have something? You know, I had a quick announcement that I like to squeeze in before oh. we 
stop recording. It's very short. Should I do? The, I could wait till after the first pe the people that have been waiting, or I could do it now. Uh, Whatever you think. Stephanie, did you want to introduce yourself really quick? Oh, you're, you're muted. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephanie Sydney. Um, I, I've been preparing a slideshow that I'd like to present at one of these. Um, should I continue to figure it? Because the last few had half an hour to present. Is that still? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah, that's still the same amount of time, yeah. So I think I can be ready in the next one or next whenever's good. September 28th. Would that be fine for you? Yeah. All right. I, I will pin to you in. But all right. right. We, we got our two present presenters for the 28th now. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And Victor? OK, yeah, I just wanted to uh, I'm just put something in the chat right now. It's an invitation to all of you. Uh, it's a LA SIGGRAPH event uh, on Zoom that's open to everybody. You don't have to be a member of LA SIGGRAPH. And it's actually on the evening of September 14th. The later, those of you that are up late, it will start uh, at 9.45 East Coast time. Uh, it'll go for about an hour, hour and a half. And it's the program is, uh, it's the main base of it is a pre-recorded program of interviews with artists uh, that were active in the 1980s in digital art, which includes myself, David M., Coco Khan, and Michael Wright. And in, in a context of a organization called EZTV, uh, that was a very important alternative electronic arts video and digital art venue <clears throat> in Los Angeles, and they interface with LA SIGGRAPH over the years. Uh, and they're going to be doing four programs one, once every year. And this is the first one. This is the 80s. Next year will be the 90s, the zeros, and then the teens, etc. So anyway, I put the uh, link in the chat, and it's totally free, but you do have to register to attend. So, Got it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for sharing. Sure. And I think, Lee, you had one quick thing that you wanted to share, or... Yeah, I, 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 I don't think there's enough time, unfortunately. Um, I wanted to sort of follow up with a few things that I, did, I missed out in the presentation last week. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I don't think, I think we need a bit more than six minutes. So <laughs> I'll just well, hold my, plus I posted stuff on the tech specialist page. So that's I, true. I had like a, a dozen, a baker's dozen of pieces that were, um, uh, were, were like, I think it was pa Patrick. I was mentioning um, the Monet. Um, well, a bunch of people were talking about Monet's um, uh, Ruin Cathedral and how he kept on going back and revisiting the same spot. And so um, I have a series, uh, which I think I'm going to drop on in NFTs. Um, I have a, well, I have 600 of them, but I'm going to whittle it down to about, about, about maybe maximum of 100 of them. Um, and it's this pool. Um, that I see in the middle of the mountain, which was um, condemned. So it's kind of like a ruined pool, a ruined pool. Um, and uh, I've got it in four seasons. It's all different types of light from uh, before sunrise to the golden hour and um, all the different seasons. And, and uh, well, I put up a dozen of them there and I love feedback with any, from anybody about them. Um, so that was my, my big thing. And then I was going to also show the the um, last time when I was presenting, I, I didn't have any of the flowers. So I, I was like, oh, I, go, I brought some flowers. And then um, last thing was a couple of new developments that I learned when I was in the hospital last week. <laughs> but um, again, those are all on Facebook and those are all um, on, on the Instagram. So it's not like they're really crucial, but I just wanted to share them with everybody and get feedback. And um, but thank you. Thank you very much for your time. And oh, thank you. Great presentation. <laughs> Yeah, some wonderful presentations. And I wasn't entirely sure, but Michael Price, did you have something you wanted to add really quick? Yeah, just, just real briefly. Um, yeah. More of, a, more of a kudos to the tech expressionist community and group. Um, and for those who may be newer, um, I have a solo show that's starting this Friday, running through September. 
And two of the text expressionist artists in the group um, helped me with that in, in doing some collaborative work on uh, creating some AR animations for me, uh, especially Lucy Boyd Wilson, who's in LA. She did the primary bulk of it, but also Carl Ram uh, Ramonde also was a consultant for me and I appreciate her work. And then a friend of mine who's not a text expressionist um, has done a 33 minute long uh, soundscape for, for the show. So uh, I'm bringing a highly interactive um, technology based, uh, you know, basis for my artwork uh, in, in September. And um, it's gonna be a really dense, uh, intellectually based uh, exhibit and uh, I needed the AR and uh, technology to help me uh, explain what's been in my brain for a long time. So, <laughs> so kudos, good. kudos to our movement, yeah. <laughs> to our community. That's, that's what we're here for. That's what we're yeah. here for. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great, Michael. Thanks. Can't wait to see it. Well, see it in any way that I can. Anyway. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. And Colin had one last thing you wanted to share. Yes, I just wanted to um, share some news. Um, I just saw um, a few minutes ago that this was just posted. Uh, so I got invited recently to speak on Texpressionism by a group called Tahoe Silicon Mountain. Um, they're based in Tahoe in California, but it's largely um, Silicon Valley um, professionals um, entrepreneurs and 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 the and the like and uh, you know should be pretty interesting. So they just posted um, it on their homepage. I'm just pasting a link in there now. It's going to be on um, uh, YouTube Live. It's a Zoom interview, but it's going to be webcast to YouTube Live and then recorded as well. So um, the timing worked out nicely. So I'll be able to you know drop a little bit of um, promo information about the salon opening up the next uh, day. Uh, for collab too and uh you know hopefully get some good exposure out there to the group because um you know there's no shortage of artists to uh to get the word out to uh, you know in terms of interest with art and technology but hopefully these will be some some people who might actually be you know collectors or enthusiasts or non-artists who just are interested about what we're all doing so uh yeah i just wanted to pass that on all right sounds great and holly uh, did you have yes um i have a question you know it's like i'm new to the group and i'm very i am i'm so thankful for connecting with you people because for the first time in my life i feel semi-grounded except you make me fly all over the place with all of your ideas and your creativity um i there are a couple of of gallery directors in manhattan who i know can I like suggest that they check the Texpressionism website and stuff? Like, can I talk about you and tell them to look at us? Yeah, I mean, I don't want, you know, it's like, I don't want to overstep. <laughs> talk about us. Yeah, talk about yes. like- Can I talk when about you us you are. That's movement? what you're saying. Just, just do it. Like you can talk about us. You can talk about the just work that we it. do. Just do it, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just Thank go you. for it. <laughs> And and on I've that mentioned note, that to, to a couple people, you know, that's that's kind of like my new way of, you know, telling people about what this is, is you can't really be excluded. I mean, you're a text expressionist when you say you are. That's that's my philosophical take on this whole deal, you know, so um, I would say anyone can be one if they want to call themselves one, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And we're we're not gonna be like we're not gonna like kick you out and be like no nah, you're not one of us I'm sorry this is this is the cool kids club you're not cool sorry Holly I think you really should tokenize that when you say <laughs> you're a tech prison is that you and that's you are <laughs> something <Yeah>. like that <laughs> that's something you should make it like an NFT and it's totally decentralized <laughs> <laughs> that'll be an interesting project but uh, we are right here at. 4 p.m. Eastern time. So this is right at the end of our uh, little... Tommy, what are you showing us? <laughs> You're muted, by the way. Just just posted to the Glitch Artist Collective. It's some interesting 3D um, model that as you rotate your screen, it, it does a sort of amazing... Oh, 
inter interweaving here. You can sort of see how it's built on the edges, though. You see how there's like a black background that's a flat plane, and then a bunch of red, green, and blue lines just sort of that will pass by each other. Sorry, I didn't mean to take over. Really, no, 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 that's cool. You're it's, doing great I, here. I, I was just, I, I was saying, like, I was waving by. Yeah, I was. I saw you wave your phone. I was like, what is he doing? Cool. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank, thank you for that <laughs> anyway back back to closing out this uh this meeting <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being here thank you much for attending and making this movement this community as great as it is because you are all wonderful people that it is my pleasure to be able to you know work with you all talk with you all and see what you're all up to and you know just having a space where we can talk about art and everything else that we care about so i i, I love this place <laughs> let's just say that i love this place and thank, thank you so you much very much davo for all your service and uh you know keeping this machine running <laughs> well thank you thank you um here's here's to our first year here's to text professionalism's first uh our community's first year and, many more. and for many more right <laughs> So thank you and thank you so much. All right. This is Davo and we'll be signing out. Right, Three, best, two, one. Bye. <laughs>